Out of all the innovative genres and tropes to emerge from the anime movement, the harem comedy is doubtless the least appreciated. Your average otaku, eager to paint their geek interests as mature and worthwhile, is keen to write harem anime off as self-indulgent frivolity. Pure escapist pablum, designed to do little more than titillate and fulfill the empty wishes of lonely, antisocial nerds. I won't deny that the genre contains such works, in fact it would be fair to say that most of the genre is such works. If you're good at drawing original boom anime babes or dang anime dudes, there's a lot of easy money to be made, sprinkling five or six of your hottest creations around a meek, unassuming dumbass whom they all want to fuck for some reason. But while I can understand the impulse to characterize harem history as little more than the race to the bottom that gave us Cat Planet Cuties, Conception, Da Capo, Freezing, Fafnir, Valex Love, Kiss X Sis, My Sister, My Writer, Sister Princess, Princess Lover, Love Love, Love, Koi Koi 7, R15, Rail Wars, Shuffle, Mouse, Deers, Kanokan, If Her Flag Breaks, Show Bitch, Makenki, Happy Lessons, School Days, Maburaho, 100, Asterisk War, Absolute Duo, Infinite Stratos, Master of Ragnarok, Death March to a Parallel World, Rhapsody, In Another World with My Smartphone, and My Personal Guilty Pleasure, Girls Bravo, I assure you as a harem connoisseur that there's more to it than just that. The harem comedy concept can be used to tell entertaining, emotionally impactful love stories packed with interesting, diversely appealing, well-realized characters who have great chemistry with both the lucky lead and one another. It's just that a lot of the time it isn't. And often there's an undercurrent of sleaze running through even the best of these shows that can be a big turnoff to folks who aren't looking to get turned on. Harems have to be horny, of course, but how the horny is framed makes a huge difference in the scope of their appeal. Ideally, you want it strong enough to satisfy those looking for it without being so blatant as to dissuade those who aren't. The gold standard for that balance up to this point has been Oron High School Host Club, which mostly buries its horny in the subtext of a charming fairy tale romance, encouraging us to gaze into the sparkling eyes up here and merely contemplate the glistening pecs down there. But even Oron is limited in its reach by the simple fact that not everyone is looking for handsome husbandos, nor is everyone interested in a parade of beautiful waifus. By their very nature, harems are somewhat exclusionary in their primary appeal. While the quality of their production may earn them fans beyond that reach, they can only ever directly service roughly half of the anime fandom at any given time. Or so I thought, until my next life as a villainous, All Roots Lead to Doom came along. I went into this show expecting to see a fun, lighthearted isekai romp through a flowery shoujo lens, and it is that, but it is also the near-perfect distillation of the harem formula that I've been searching for all my life. This video is brought to you by Bookwalker, Kadokawa's official ebook store, where you can read hundreds upon hundreds of English language manga and light novels, including, as you can probably guess, My Next Life as a Villainous, on your phone, tablet, or PC. Until June 4th, in celebration of the anime, both the original light novels and the manga adaptation of Villainous are on sale for 20% off. And if you use my promo code BASEMENT when you buy them, you can get an additional 600 yen discount, which means that the first volume of the hilarious light novel will run you just 60 cents. The toughest part of following any kind of rom-com anime is the weeks, sometimes years-long wait for those doki doki developments, so if the anime's made you fall in love with these characters but the pacing feels slow to you, now's a great time to read ahead and see how their love stories shake out. Speaking of the characters, those are, of course, the most essential element of the formula we're discussing today. Above all else, a harem anime must deliver either handsome husbandos you just have to hug or button cute waifus who demand your devotion. Or else, what is even the point? My Next Life as a Villainous gets that twice over. It gives us both in equal measure and all of equally exceptional quality and viability. Of course, from the series premise, which sees an otaku girl whose life was cut tragically short reincarnated as Katarina Clias, the villainous who dies at the end of almost every route in her favorite otome game, you'd only expect to see some quality bishis in the mix, 
and the show doesn't disappoint on that front. The first we meet is Katarina's fiance, confident, elegant Prince Giordo, whom our heroine remembers from Fortune Lover as a black-hearted sadist who secretly resents his bitchy betrothed and hides his true nature behind a sweet, princely smile. In the game, Giordo has a strained relationship with his twin brother Alan, who is consumed by feelings of inferiority toward him and has developed a brash ego and somewhat childish demeanor as a result. Katarina has a brother too, or stepbrother at least. Keith, a magical prodigy whom her father adopted from the Clyes branch family after he accidentally hurt his real brothers in a fit of rage over them torturing a small bird. In Fortune Lover, Keith was further isolated by Katarina's incessant bullying and filled the loneliness in his heart by growing up to be a cold and frivolous, if exceedingly pretty, playboy. Last, but certainly not least, there's Nicol Ascart soft-spoken son of the Prime Minister and Katarina's senior at the magic school that served as the game's setting. Devastatingly handsome, with deep black eyes and a devilish grin that can instantly charm any man or woman alive, Nickel cares only for the charms of one other person, his delicate and bookish albino sister, Sophia, who is just as much a top-tier cutie as he is. In the original game, Katarina and Sophia didn't actually know each other at all, but in this new timeline, they bond as kids over a shared love for trashy pulp romance novels, the closest thing to shoujo manga Katarina can find in this world. Katarina also befriends Prince Alan's fiance, buxom brunette Mary Hunt, after complimenting her on the cultivation of her family's stunning flower garden and asking for help with her own vegetable farm, which she's working on to hone her earth magic and also feed herself if and when she gets exiled. We spend the first three episodes gradually getting to know these characters as Katarina's friends in the revised childhood created by her body's otaku inhabitant before heading off to magic school to meet the show's final waifu, fortune lover's protagonist, Maria Campbell. Maria is a beautiful blonde commoner, gifted with the rare power to heal using light magic, whose natural warmth thaws the frozen hearts of the game's leading men. In the original timeline, Katarina bullied her mercilessly, but here she quickly becomes her dearest friend, defending her from other noble bullies jealous of her magical talent. Katarina has an ulterior motive in all this, of course. She wants to be as close as possible to Maria so that when she inevitably falls for one of Katarina's friends who are boys, Katarina won't have to be taken out of the picture. What our leading lady doesn't realize is that this will never happen for two reasons. The first is that all of Fortune Lover's husbandos have become fundamentally different people from the ones who fell for Maria as a result of Katarina's kindness toward them early in life. Giordo is much more earnest and happy as he no longer needs to hide his contempt for his fiancée. Alan has found self-confidence through his musical skills and has a shy, humble charm about him as a result. Though that charm doesn't seem to have much effect on his fiancée, Mary, who's every bit as sweet and dignified as she was in the game, just not sweet on Alan specifically. Keith, having been raised in a loving home alongside a doting sister, has grown into a true gentleman. And Nickel, well, Nickel still doesn't talk much, but for entirely different reasons, and he smiles a little more than he did in the game, making him a threat to everyone around him. But all of that is collateral damage from his sister smiling more often as well. Thanks to Katarina's friendship and praise, Sophia managed to break out of her shell and learn to love herself. And also, someone else. Which brings us to the second reason. All of those fundamentally different people are already in love with someone else. Katarina. Even especially the girls. See, while she was busy tiptoeing around the minefield of death flags that surrounded her as a villainess, Katarina inadvertently tripped over every single romance flag for every single love interest and rival in the game, plus the protagonist herself. Katarina even remembers some of these events from the game as romance flags and feels bad about stealing them from the boys and girls for whom they were intended, but she never once follows that train of thought to its very obvious logical conclusion. To be fair though, logic isn't exactly Katarina's strong suit, nor is any thinking-related task, really, because she's dumb. Incredibly, 
hilariously dumb. There's a whole council of Katarinas up in her head, and everyone is just as stupid as the last. There's a happy idiot, a scared idiot, a brave idiot, an idiot in glasses who really has no place talking down to the other idiots as much as she does, and a mustachioed idiot in judge robes who mediates between all of them. And they all Voltron together to create the uber idiot known as Baccarina. That nickname is a term of endearment, by the way. Katarina's idiocy is one of her best traits. She's an oblivious antidote to the devious pretension of high-class society that twisted the characters of Fortune Lover into their original tormented incarnations. The technical term for this is Bacadere, a waifu or shonen protagonist so unfathomably stupid that it's impossible to take their sweet demeanor and kind behavior at anything but face value, and impossible to be mad at them when they inevitably say something, well, stupid. Done right, the Bacadere provides a simple and clean escape from the messy complexity of real life, and Baccarina is one of the best written examples of the trope in modern anime. Add to that huge anime titty, a cute face well suited to smug, vacant, and villainous expressions specifically, and fantastic fashion sense, and you've got a protagonist every bit as hot and lovable as the anime hotties who love her. Actually, she's quite possibly the best girl in the entire cast, which is no mean feat feet, believe me. With her, the series achieves perfect harem harmony. Four waifus, four husbandos. At the same time, she's basically perfect as a protagonist. There are a lot of things in harem comedies that just sort of take care of themselves from a writing perspective. With multiple characters vying for the same love interest, you can create friction and conflict wherever you need it for the plot without it ever feeling unnatural or forced. And so long as those characters are all appealing in their own way, you can put off plot progression all but indefinitely without having to worry about your audience getting too bored. But none of that can function properly if you don't get the harem hero right, and that's a tricky balancing act. Unless you're going for hard etchy or you've got Got some kind of supernatural gimmick going for you like the world god only knows, your harem protagonist needs to perpetuate a will-they-won't-they they relationship with several other characters simultaneously for most of the series duration without coming off like a sleazebag who's stringing them along or an indecisive coward. It needs to make sense that all of these impossibly hot anime people would fall for them, and they need to be likable enough that all of us out here simping for our best girl or boy of choice will accept the protagonist winning that waifu or husbando's heart. A lot of harem anime try to get around this by turning their heroes into horny blank slates with a few token geek interests onto whom the nerdy audience is meant to project its own personality and desires. I've never seen this actually work. Invariably, these characters strip what little believability the genre has away by being unfuckably boring. They're also, more often than not, insufferable wimps actively detracting from the character chemistry that's supposed to make these shows funny. It should go without saying that a character-driven comedy will suffer if its main character isn't a character. So harem protagonists really need to have well-defined personalities that fit the demands of the role. Haruhi Fujioka makes it work by being too busy to worry much about romance and too smart to fall for the host club's fuckboy charms. Ranma makes it work by being too prideful to admit his feelings and too passionate to put love ahead of martial arts, and Katarina makes it work by being too stupid to notice the feelings of others, but also too genuinely nice for them to take it personally. Plus, as she's a top-tier waifu herself, I can hardly take it personally when I see her sweep all of my other waifus off their feet. Not that I'd <clears throat> mind seeing that either way. Note to self, look up doujins later. Now, I can't speak for anyone who's pining for Jordo, Alan, Keith, or Nickel, but Baccarina's a hard woman to hate, so I can't imagine too many of you resent her either. It makes perfect sense why each of them would fall for her too, and fall so deeply that they'd willingly weather the harem for her. For Jordo, whose sadism was born from boredom with his princely life, Katarina's unpredictable antics and hilarious stupidity are welcome entertainment. She's the most interesting girl he's ever met by a country mile, and she's unambiguously kind to him when most everyone else he meets wants something from him. Plus, she helped him finally find a connection with his estranged brother. Speaking of brothers, it makes sense that Keith, who was always alone before meeting Katarina, would be so drawn to the first person who ever showed him real love, and who dragged him kicking and screaming out of his shell. He owes her practically everything, and he met her right at the age when boys of his class start getting engaged. 
It's only natural that he'd think of her that way. For Mary, Katerina was the first person to recognize her talent and validate her in the face of her sister's merciless abuse. She gave her cause to be confident again, to pursue her passions and improve herself, and helped her find new passions and a new friend through their romance novel club. By seducing his fiancée, Katerina unwittingly made a rival of the young and egotistical Prince Alan, which is also how his root and fortune lover started, though that was academic, not romantic, and while losing to her at tree climbing frustrated him, beating her at piano helped him realize that he had his own value distinct from her and his brother. Alan's a bit too dense of a spiky shonen boy to realize his feelings, though, and Mary is all too happy to help perpetuate his lack of awareness in order to keep him out of the picture as a rival. Unfortunately for her, the most dangerous rival of all is on a tag team. As a hopeless siscon, Nickel was always bound to fall for the first girl to recognize how great his sister is, and as a hopeless brocon, it only makes sense to Sophia to set the two people she loves most up with each other. And I mean, they're all European aristocracy, so in all likelihood helping Nickel get what he wants from Katarina will result in his sister getting what she wants as well. Frankly, given the setting, it would be weirder if it wasn't like that. The high-class, vaguely Victorian romance angle also provides a perfect excuse to hide the horny, in much the same way that the ultra-wealthy academy setting of Or on imposed a certain level of restraint on its hosts. The Hitachi twins flouted that as shamelessly as they could within the limits of the show's age rating, of course, and likewise, some of Baccarina's suitors are more forward than others. Giordo likes to peck her on the neck and is making active efforts to surreptitiously get her in the sack, for instance. And he would have gotten away with it, too, if not for her meddling brother, who generally does a good job of keeping things from getting too saucy. As girls, Sophia and Mary have more leeway to flirt without it seeming improper, and their shared love for trashy romance novels provides excellent cover to say audacious things to their just-a-friend-don't-worry-about-it. Also, there's just something about Mary. Then, of course, there's Maria, a shameless harlot who has no qualms about being unspeakably lewd with Katerina, in public no less. And Katarina herself has said some pretty daring things just because she's too stupid not to. Thus far, though, the show's spice level has been decidedly mild, limited to innuendo and very meaningful looks, which is more than enough to know exactly what everyone's thinking and who they're thinking it about. Now, if you've seen my videos about high school DXD and how not to summon a demon lord, you know I'm all too happy to see my harems go wild, but I also like them when they stay wholesome, and like I said at the top of the video, I think that approach gives them a much wider potential reach. If you're just not into fan service, you can enjoy this show without having to worry about it and see what makes harem so fun for yourself. And if you are, well, I'm sure there are some independent artists out there who are more than willing to pick up the slack. Which leads us to the one last point of potential contention I have with calling this a truly perfect harem anime. It may also be down to those artists to help these characters go the distance. It's obviously not uncommon for harem anime to give their heroes harem endings, but it is sadly rare to see in the really good ones. Shows that have a strong focus on character chemistry and loving romance tend to weed out potential suitors until only one true pair remains. Which, don't get me wrong, can be really satisfying and cathartic to watch unfold. Quintessential Quintuplets stakes its whole story on the promise of such an ending, and it makes for a really compelling hook. But I do think that a truly perfect expression of the harem concept would need to take it all the way to its logical conclusion, and earn that conclusion in a believable, satisfying manner. Which isn't easy, but neither is it impossible, and I do think that My Next Life as a Villainess has the potential to pull it off. For a harem ending to really work beyond the basic satisfaction of fan service desires, you've got to make the audience believe that all of the different suitors could conceivably share both their love interest and a home with each other without anyone ending up dead in the process. It's not enough for them to simply love the protagonist enough to put up with it, that's never gonna last. They have to be able to love their harem mates as well, if not as lovers, then at least as family. And the chemistry between all of the characters in Villainous is strong enough that I think that it could happen. They're all good friends with each other, even if they do butt heads, and in alternate timelines, 
many of these characters do end up together. Mary sees Alan as a rival in this timeline, but she's madly in love with him in the original game. And Maria, who's the best individual pairing for Katarina besides maybe Sophia, don't fucking at me, has romantic potential with every boy she knows by design. As you'd expect of someone who can just fucking hold a hand like that. There are some obvious points of friction that would need to be addressed. Keith and Jordo have some shit to work through, but nothing that feels truly insurmountable in the same way as, say, trying to have Shampoo get along with literally anyone who's not Ranma. And again, these are all aristocrats. Eight-way polygamy is pretty normal by their standards. Of course, with eight main characters, the show could also pair everyone off in a really satisfying manner. Mary and Katarina and their respective fiancés seem genuinely good for each other. Keith and Sophia have a lot in common. They both appreciate Katarina and know the value of a good sibling, for starters. And that just leaves Maria and Nickel and frankly, those sluts deserve each other. Or you could swap the last two. Sure, it violates rule D, but again, aristocracy. Then again, Maria and Katerina are kind of perfect for each other, and frankly, all of the ladies would be better for her than any of the dudes. I don't know, there's a lot of possibilities to juggle here. I'd love to hear what pairings you guys think make the most sense in the comments down below. Ironically, I can't see any of the possible routes in my next life as a villainess leading to doom for the series. All of the potential endings make enough sense to land it in the upper echelons of the harem canon, even if it falls short of the crown. Either way, you won't find many finer examples of the weird, self-indulgent subgenre than this, or many that are more accessible and respectable, if you care about that sort of thing. As a harem aficionado, My Next Life as a Villainous, All Roots Lead to Doom, has been one of my favorite shows to keep up with this season, and I'm eager to see where it goes next. So eager, in fact, that I might just go to Bookwalker myself to see. That 20% discount is good until the 4th of June, and remember, even if you're watching this after the fact, you can still use the promo code BASEMENT when you check out to get 600 yen off My Next Life as a Villainous or any of the other great books in their store. Click the links in the doobly-doo to see more. Or, hey, if you'd like to stick around on YouTube for a while longer, I've got some other great videos about harem anime for you to enjoy, including my PSA on how to survive a harem, which is a little too spicy for YouTube's end cards, apparently, so I'll leave a link to that in the doobly-doo as well. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.